Good day, everyone. Welcome to Open Innovation in the Financial Services Sector. My name is Leslie Hawthorne, and along with my colleague, Joe Giordano, we're going to talk to you today about how co-creating open source software is of great benefit to your business. Uh, to briefly recap our agenda for today, we're going to, of course, give you a little bit of more information about uh, us and why we're here to present to you today. We're going to talk about how open source software is ubiquitous across the financial services sector. We're going to talk about the process of moving from being a user and a consumer of open source software to contributing to open source software projects and the benefits of doing so. Uh, we'll also make sure to give you some concrete ways to get started contributing to open source software projects. Uh, and last but not least, we're going to give you folks some resources so that you can learn more uh, about this topic area after our presentation today. So. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I uh, was fortunate enough to, to learn uh, the best way to describe myself a couple of years ago from my manager here at Red Hat, Deborah Bryant. She said, Leslie, you're a super connector. You're one of those people who knows everybody and is always there quietly behind the scenes, helping them to collaborate and get good stuff done. Um, so I've been doing that uh, throughout my career in the tech industry a little more than 15 years. Um, I've had roles previously working in open source at Google at Elastic, and I'm actually on my second stint at Red Hat. I'm what we call a boomerang, someone who loves Red Hat so much they came back to work here a second time. Uh, I've, in addition to uh, my professional uh, work with open source, I've also done voluntary work for several um, open source software nonprofits uh, in board, director, or advisory roles, including the Open Source Initiative. Uh, and I'm a proud contributor to Finos's Open Source Readiness Working Group. How about you, Joe? Hi, thank you, Leslie. So my name is Joe Giordano. I'm a chief architect with the Northeast Office, Regional Office of Technology. Um, I've been with Red Hat for over seven years now as a solution architect, helping customers get business value out of open source technologies and solutions and helping them with their business in digital transformations. Um, I've worked at a number of different software and media companies over the years and um, have spent over 20 plus years in technology. Um, I'm happy to talk to you guys today about some of the things I've learned and and encourage all of you to start to participate in open source communities so that you can derive a lot of the value and benefits from them. Next slide. Very cool. Okay, so, you know, open source is everywhere in your business and your business can't function without open source uh, today. Um, in fact, you know, we've heard numerous times that open source is, uh, software is, is eating the world, right? So um, what Red Hat does is every year we um, charter a state of the enterprise open source survey uh, and we enlist the third party to do that. So the third party Illuminus was uh, asked to poll some of them customers, others not customers of Red Hat across um, 11 different countries. Um, and these decision makers and, and IT leaders um, you know, we asked them a number of questions around enterprise open source technology, and um, we asked them how important it was to their strategic vision in their organization. Um, not surprisingly, 95% said that open source is important to their organization. Digging a little bit deeper, we see that, you know, 36% and 39% view it as extremely and very important. And that really makes up the bulk of 75% of the respondents. Um, and that's up 16, from 69% uh, of the previous year's survey. So, you know, open source is really the technical side of open innovation in commercial and financial services industries. Um, from open banking to PSD2, open source development and standardization on open source is allowing, you know, users and, and fintechs and other organizations to take advantage of the data and services that weren't previously available. Um, you know, there's a there's a great great quote that you know um, is is talked a lot about in in the open source community, and it's it's not a question of whether to use open source, but it's really more how do you do it more strategically, efficiently, and extensively than your competitors. Next slide. So deriving some of the data out of the state of the open source enterprise open source report. Uh, we can see that, you know, it's really open source is being used across all facets of the IT organization. As a field resource for Red Hat, I've helped numerous organizations implement tools like Ansible for infrastructure and DevOps pipelines, Red Hat runtimes to modernize their applications, and OpenShift to enable IT to deliver uh, 
modern Kubernetes-based container platform for their customers. Um, I've worked extensively with a lot of large financials. Uh, one example of that is Deutsche Bank, who is a good Red Hat customer um, and has spoken at Summit quite a few times. Um, they were able to modernize their PaaS platform from what they previously had and they called uh, Deutsche Application Platform, DEP, to a Kubernetes-based platform based on OpenShift, you, in which they've named Fabric. Um, and they've been able to take advantage of a multi-cloud architecture. They've really been on this modernization journey for a while with us, um, starting with OpenShift 3. And they've implemented the platform while also redefining their application development strategy and transforming their DevOps and SRE practices. So they've not only successfully implemented the technology, but they've transformed their organization. Some of the benefits that they've publicly highlighted are that they've cut end-to-end -end application development from six to nine months to two to three weeks. They've also significantly simplified their DevOps collaboration processes using flexible integration and an agile approach. And they've also optimized the use and cost of data center and cloud capacity by implementing microservices, containers, and cloud bursting technologies. Next slide. So <clears throat> taking a look at um, the, the benefits that enterprises consider to be the, the, the top reasons for them you know, using open source software, I think that um, you know, some of these are not necessarily going to be a surprise. For example, lower, to lower total cost of ownership. Um, but I, you know, when we look at the other two uh, top benefits listed based on uh, the Illumina survey that uh, Joe referred to, you know, we're looking at higher quality software and better security. So the idea that because there is this community of people coming together to create um, value in the form of software, because there is that wisdom of the crowds in operation, there is, is a higher level of quality of software produced. And also this, this whole concept that is often referred to as Linus's law, right? The idea that with enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. So open source software is able to provide a more secure operating environment for the businesses who are using it. And it's it's 100%, um, you know, my experience that organizations not only derive these benefits through using open source software, but they, they derive even deeper benefit by being there to co-create that software because by being there to work alongside the folks who are creating the products that you use, you're able to ensure that your your use case is attended to. You're you're able to find out more about um, ways in which the security may be vulnerable faster, and you're also able to, um, to to leverage what has been created that much more effectively because your in-house team has been there each step of the journey to help create it. So. Hopefully we have uh, convinced you that open source is important to you. And let's talk a little bit about how you can move from um, just using open source software to actually co uh, contributing to it and making it better. So I think one thing that's, uh, that's really important to know when we talk about you know, open source software, we're not just talking to you about the, the software stack you're selecting, right? Um, open source is 100% an innovation model, right? And when you decide that you're going to go in all in on open source software, you're, you're making a statement to your employees about how your organization is going to do its work, um, how it's going to produce value, how they're going to be engaging with their own customers, and you know, how your organization is going to meet new challenges that are posed to it, right? Like thinking back to, to Joe's earlier example of Deutsche Bank and how they've been able to, to transform their operations and now can deliver value instead of in, in months, in, instead in days, right? And when you choose open source software, you're, you're embedding that statement of purpose and how you are going to innovate into uh, the set of tools that you are using that enable or disable certain organizational capabilities, right? You're choosing the tools that are fundamental to the rethinking of how you operate and you generate your value for your end customer. So, uh, you know, I really love this quote from, from Greg Sattel, right? And he, he says, for the past few decades, agility in the technology sector has largely meant moving faster and faster down to a predetermined path. Over the coming decades, however, agility will take a new meaning, the ability to explore multiple domains at once and combine them into something that produces value. This change will be profound. We need to rethink old notions about how we compete, collaborate, and bring new products to market. Um, 
And the, the part about, you know, rethinking old notions is really striking, right? It indicates, once again, that the challenges that face most organizations are not really about technology. Um, they're not about problems of finding or acquiring or inventing new tools to do the same work faster or more efficiently. It's really um, problems that cut to the core of how we operate and how we participate in, in interconnected webs of innovation and evolution that are happening in places that we may not have considered that may in fact be uh, be happening with our competitors. So now that we talked a little bit about that and Leslie, you know, conveyed, um, you know, that the benefits and started to convey a lot of the benefits. Um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the different types of models um, of engagement with open source technologies, right? Because there's, there's quite a few different models that we're going to talk about today um, and we want to focus on. So um, I've broken this out into four different areas and uh, we'll start with the most widespread open source relationship model, which is actually the consumption model. And, um, you know, I have a, a very high degree of confidence today that if you're listening to this talk, your organization is using open source in some capacity, whether it's enterprise open source from a vendor like Red Hat or, you know, open source from straight from the community that a developer downloaded and incorporated or a tool that your operations team is using. Um, and you're, you're seeing obvious benefits from this technology. Um, and there are also some risks that, you know, we'll talk about, um, especially when implementing completely upstream open source projects um, in a consumption only model. And again, this drives the benefit of whether the, the you know, thesis of why we want you to co-create. Next, let's discuss a little bit about open sourcing of specific projects. Now, what we've seen over the past few years is some of the financial services organizations um, and other companies have decided to fully release specific projects that they've developed into um, the open source uh, community and try to develop a strong community around it. The code's been vetted internally. The organization has done their legal due diligence and corporate due diligence to make sure, sure there's no proprietary secrets or special sauce in there. Um, they've also, you know, they, a lot of these communities that have been full-fledged open source projects being donated have seen mixed results with some really taking off and taking hold with others not gaining as much traction. And we'll touch upon some of the more successful ones in a few slides. Next, uh, you know, I wanna highlight a, a, a way of contributing to open source, which is a little bit more private. Um, and it's a really good way for organizations to get started with the idea of setting up reusability frameworks and setting up code sharing cap capabilities. And this is, called InnerSource, and there's a few companies that are pioneering this. Um, this is where an organization puts structures in place that enable the sharing of code between development groups and other application groups. Um, it could be within IT or within lines of business, but the organization puts together a framework that makes people comfortable with the sharing. Um, there's a good chance that a lot of the capabilities that developers are working on, um, small functions and, and capabilities are, are duplicated throughout the organization. So there's benefits of normalizing this process and um, reducing the deduplication of efforts. Uh, this is probably one of the easier ways for your organization to start getting their code out there internally. Um, and it'll enable your organization to share and improve and pull from a common repository internally. So lastly, I'll hit on the most mature model, which is the participation in open source communities. And this is why Leslie and I are here for you today. Um, this is when you participate in a project that's outside of your organization. The level of maturity here is increasing. Um, the risk slightly increases, but will help you understand how to reduce that risk. Um, and it's still very rare in financial services. This is the model we want to encourage you, our financial services customers, to drive towards. And we'll talk about this and give you a roadmap. Next slide, please. So I, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, um, differentiating between the consumption model and the co-creation model, right? So we'll talk a little bit about the consumption model. And, and, and here, I want to walk through why there are risks in a consumption-only model. Um, let's say you're using an open source project extensively throughout your organization and the auditors come to you and say, this piece of software requires this type of transaction tracking capability or logging capabilities. Um, and this, you know, this 
you can't just rip and replace this software with something that has this functionality. Um, now you're, you know, you're, you're tasked with th three options really to get this functionality into your open source software that you're using. You can ask the community for a uh, request for enhancement, which they may or not be able to accommodate. You might be able to ask a vendor that supports this software or another vendor that's willing to make the change and, and ca either carry the patch or get it merged into the project in some reasonable time frame. You know, obviously there are probably significant costs to this. Um, or you can make the change yourself and carry the patch privately. So you have to ask yourself, how urgent is this change to your organization? Is it a security-based change? Is there risk involved? Um, you know, does it go beyond what the community sees, you know, the, the risk and what they're, you know, working on in their vision? Does this change give you a major business advantage? Do you want to work on this change in private and make it something that you are going to completely um, keep? Are you going to fork the project internally? Are you willing to maintain that fork for, you know, some time frame? Or are you going to backport the patches to the original upstream project as it progresses and have to maintain that testing and, and those capabilities, you know, release over release? And has maintaining this fork or carrying the patches, at whichever you choose, put your organization in a very risky situation? Are you allocating resources to this, um, to this methodology or this uh, development capability um, that if these resources were to leave, um, you'd be in a, a severe disadvantage or um, disabled state. And, you know, does this technical debt that you're accruing grow year over year and compound? I've, see, I've actually seen this play out in, you know, a few organizations. So a, as a real world example, there was a uh, soft, open source software project uh, called OpenEFS that was based on OpenAFS a few years back. And it was a distributed file system created that created namespaces on top of NFS shares or NAS shares. Um, and it helped solve a problem with software distribution that wasn't available at the time. There were a few contributors, but the community was fairly small. And a lot of organizations adopted it and would customize it on their own. The community itself stopped getting contributions about six to eight years ago, but this piece of software was still being utilized, you know, extensively throughout uh, financial services firms in Wall Street. So now as technology increased, the it was up to the organizations to either up, keep continuously updating that software without a community and keep those patches and, and accrue more technical debt, or they needed to, you know, move off that so piece of software. And as we all know in the software industry, if something's working, people are reluctant to make that change. And generally, we, we have a tendency to kick the can down the road and look at it at a, at a later date. So, you know, the, the lessons learned from, you know, not being able to install this software on later operating systems because uh, the, the supported libraries were no longer available or security vulnerabilities that weren't being patched because there was no community left, put a lot of these organizations in a very expensive situation five or six years down the road. And, you know, the thing that I want you to take away from this is, you know, either you're going to maintain the project if the community isn't robust and, and dies, um, or you're going to spend a lot of money uh, customizing it and, and um, or getting someone to customize it for you. So isolation, software development, open source software development in isolation can get very expensive. Next slide. So <clears throat> when we're talking about some of the ways that open source co-creation actually creates business value, um, I'm just going to go down down the list of where we see value created uh, at Red Hat, right? These are, these are the reasons why we co-create open source software um, and where we've seen um, open source co-creation creating value for, for our customers and our colleagues, right? Um, we've already talked about minimizing technical debt. Thank you very much, Joe, for story time. I always love story time. Um, this whole idea of, you know, innovating to be able to, to try new things custom and then customize them, right, which you can't do with proprietary software investments. You can't extend those things. You can't uh, make the software do uh, additional things in order to meet your needs without relying on someone else's release schedule and timeline. And, you know, they may not even think that the, the feature that you're requesting is particularly important to them. 
Um, and then there's also this, you know, dovetailing right wind with that, right? This idea of failing fast and experimenting in order to to create value quickly, right? Being able to quickly spin up a minimum viable product and do some kind of user acceptance testing to to understand if that software is actually uh, meeting folks' needs, right? Um, I could go go through the list, but obviously, um, you know, all of you folks can can read the slide. Joe, are you seeing the same things in in your discussions with customers in terms of why they think that co you know they of our customers who are engaged in the process of co-creating are they seeing the same reasons for it adding value to their business, or are they seeing other areas where it's helpful to them? Yeah, absolutely, Leslie. So you know, when we were talking about this uh, the the agenda in the talk, I reached out to a number of different customers. And, um, you know, a few of them who participate in open source communities, you know, they, they definitely confirm that, you know, these, these are valuable benefits to their business. I mean, higher quality software, you know, bugs in production are expensive. Um, you know, the, the innovation, the being able to try things before making a full-fledged financial commitment to them. Um, you know, technology-wise, is re was really important to this organization. So, you know, again, part of my job, my the great part of my job is really interacting with so many different types of customers in the field. And you know, as talking to one particular open source developer who uh, works in you know a financial uh, large bank, um, he confirmed that all of these are benefits that his organization looks to when developing open source software. Security is a very big one, and I'll hone in on that a little bit. But you know, again, the more eyes that that see it, the, you know, it's open. There's no surprises. Um, they they feel that you know the the risk is much lower with open source software. Um, so what they did is they actually set up an open source program office. Um, the open source program office sets the boundaries and the rules around all the different types of community interaction in, that this organization and the developers in this organization participate in, um, along with an approval process for contributing open source software. Um, this allowed them to really take advantage and. Um, make it a culture where it's permeated throughout the organization and encouraged to contribute to open source software. Once everybody was comfortable in this organization, you know, and open source, you know, participation started to proliferate, um, they were able to move much faster and deploy different platforms without as large a capital investment that they previously had. Um, and then they were able to choose better platforms for their business. Uh, they started contributing code enhancing those projects and really making those projects even more and more beneficial to their organization. So next slide. So, you know, Leslie worked, works with the Finos organization for quite some time. You know, myself, I'm, I've worked with Finos a little bit, you know, throughout the years, but one of the great things about Finos is um, it's, it's an incubator where um, organizations can help or donate open source projects and work with Finos for their open source strategy. And over the past couple of years, we've seen a few organizations listed here, you know, open, which gave and donated open source projects to Finos and, and just outside to the community um, that, you know, previously we would have never seen before. So organizations like Goldman and JPMC and Capital One and Deutsche Bank have all open sourced, uh, you know, projects that they've felt um, could benefit not only other people, but even themselves for this open innovation and co-creation of, of software. So, you know, just going through the list at a high level, you know, a, an a great example of the community, building communities are, you know, just the Symphony community and the contributions that it's had over the past couple of years and Capital One's Hygieia platform, uh, which has really taken hold and, and has established a really strong community with contributions from a lot of different organizations. So these organizations are starting to really see the benefits of participating, co-creating, and open sourcing internal projects that they feel are widely used in the vertical and industry. Next slide. Very cool. So um, if we have not uh, done a good enough job to convince you that uh, there are many benefits to community participation, you can see several here uh, on screen. But one of the, the ones that I tend to harp on, um, since I have a, a long time ago background in human resources, is this concept of, of attracting and retaining better talent. Um, 
I think it's no secret that it is extremely difficult to come by professionals who have the, the skill set that we require no matter where we're working uh, in the technology industry. And it's, it's particularly important to realize the degree to which being able to participate in open source software projects has become a requirement of software development professionals now. Um, you know, there's this, this concept of GitHub is your resume. And for folks who are, uh, you know, focused on making sure that they stay at the top of their craft, the, the latest and greatest developments in software are happening in open source. And people want to have the opportunity to work with technologies like, for example, Kubernetes or um, you know, the latest and greatest, uh, you know, financial JavaScript framework, right? So the, the idea that, um, you know, there, there is a benefit to participating in the community because it can help you to find the talent that you need because they're participating in that community right along with you. Or you're, you're simply able to make sure that your staff remains invested in working at your organization because they're able to work on the cool latest and greatest technologies and not just in, um, you know, maintaining a, a back office system where the lights need to be kept on, right? So, you know, again, this idea that there's there's so many benefits to to participating uh, in a community and we want to we want to spend some time now um, talking to you a little bit about about how you can do that in, in ways that make sense for your business. So we wanted to, to start really with with easy steps that your organization can take to, to start co-creating with the open source community, right? Like we've we've encouraged you to do it and we wanted to give very clear, very concrete steps that you can take to actually begin participating in ways that make sense for your business. So you can see if you wanna take it even further. So step one uh, is this idea of kind of uh, follow along and learn, right? So nominate someone from your organization to to do some research on a particular open source project, right? And do that by, um, you know, actively engaging by listening, right? You don't have to contribute code. You don't have to ship a feature. You can just kind of understand what's going on, right? Look at uh, discussion forums, check out what's going on with the project in social media, um, see what's going on on the project mailing list. Some projects have weekly or monthly community calls where they talk about all aspects of the project. So the community calls sometimes take place weekly, sometimes they take place bi-weekly, sometimes they take place monthly. Uh, there is typically an agenda published in advance. If you attend one of these community calls, you are asked to at least introduce yourself and let folks know what firm you're from. If you don't have anything else to contribute during the community call, that's perfectly fine. It's absolutely acceptable to just listen and learn. And this is an opportunity for someone from your organization to learn more about what's going on in the project in terms of technical direction, in terms of areas to contribute, uh, in terms of upcoming events, which you may want to sponsor or send folks to attend to learn more. So again, it's a very um, useful way to, to literally have the opportunity to just reach out and understand what the different participants in the community are doing uh, in, a, in a very, um, low barrier to entryway of what is happening in that project community. And that gives you a, a, a pretty good, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down read on how healthy that project is, which helps you for your future planning and, and risk mitigation strategies. So step two, this is more the, the medium sized level of engagement, right? Um, you can you can offer financial support to the open source projects that, that you utilize. And this could come in the form of uh, sponsoring their user conference. This could come in the form of an actual uh, donation to a software foundation in support of the project's development. Um, you know, it's if the easiest thing for your organization to do is to write a check versus to donate employee time, there are lots of organizations who are in that position. Open source projects absolutely welcome financial support for their efforts. Um, and you can also look at providing in-kind donations for open source software projects as well. And these can include things that are, um, you know, that may not readily spring to mind. But for example, I know, uh, I believe Cisco offers WebEx, free WebEx accounts to um, open source projects and other nonprofits. Um, some projects are looking for, you know, things like, uh, you know, computing resources or server space to host their mailing lists. Um, some uh, organizations are looking at things like, uh, you know, software license seats that may be possible because your company produces that software. So, um, you know, providing in-kind donations is, a, is a, again, it's a low cost and low commitment way to support the projects that are making the software that your business depends upon. And where you can, if you have human resources to spare, uh, it's great 
to donate the time of your employees who are working on you know, non-software development aspects of the project. Um, every open source project needs help with documentation. Many projects need help with marketing so that more folks are aware of that project and their capabilities. Lots of projects are doing various user events and they're looking for folks who can help them you know, set up a virtual event or find the right speaker to, to address their user group, right? Those are all ways in which uh, your organization can contribute to the health and success of an open source software project. But again, has nothing to do with contributing code or opening up your business to any sort of risk that's associated with software development and uh, taking that software outside of your firewall. Uh, <clears throat> and then the, the advanced the advanced level, right, is, is actually um, asking your software developers to engage directly with the project. And there are any number of ways to do this, and it's it's very useful to make sure that you have uh, an organization within your company, such as an open source program office or uh, an institutional review board who makes sure that there are very clear rules of engagement for your organization as you start contributing software to uh, external open source projects. Uh, and it's also, um, you know, it make it very clear how you expect your developers to engage. But at that point, you know, let them go and just do something that might be fun, right? Lots of open source software projects will label uh, issues in their issue tracker with uh, things like newcomer or getting started or or welcome tasks that are just to, to get people used to the process of contributing to the project so they understand, for example, how to properly use the style guide or, you know, what does an appropriate commit message look like for the project? And give your developers the opportunity to go and do a few small fixes. See if they like working in, uh, working in that project community. See if they feel like they're deriving benefit from it. And if everything is, is going well after you've taken these, these first few steps, you can start looking at contributing uh, you know, on a wider basis, maybe an entire new feature, maybe uh, resolving some outstanding issues that are also plaguing your organization and that you fixed internally and you want to contribute that change back upstream, right? So to conclude, um, we wanted to, to share some resources with you folks if you wanted to, to learn more about the subjects that we've been talking about. And just, to, you know, we wanted to be really clear that these are things we regularly use ourselves. So uh, we hope you will also find great benefit in them. So I cannot say enough good things about the Finos Open Source Readiness Working Group. Um, I'm a regular participant whenever my schedule permits. And uh, the Phoenix Open Source Working Group is a practitioner-led group of folks who are all members of um, Phoenix member companies. And they are sharing best practices and tools to help um, their fellow colleagues in financial services be able to successfully engage on their open source journey. We, there's typically a weekly speaker. We've had folks talking about subjects, everything from um, you know, open source licensing protocols, to open data licensing. We've had discussions about how to create training programs for your employees so that they successfully contribute to open source in a way that is in keeping with the company's uh, open source program office or institutional review board's rules. So it's it's really a great opportunity for you to come and either share your wisdom or ask your questions or do both from folks who are um, also experiencing the same set of, of challenges and opportunities for success that you are. So if you're able to attend, I uh, highly recommend at the very least subscribe to the mailing list so that you understand what sessions are coming up and potentially can watch uh, recordings or later write-ups. Uh, another area where I have found uh, great value is within the open organization community. This is a global community of individuals who uh, come together, again, to share best practices and principles around understanding how we can change notions of how we work together, uh, how we manage our teams, how we function as individuals who are leading projects, and to move beyond the, the idea of sort of traditional hierarchical models into doing things more the open source way where there is uh, a, an openness to new ideas, where there is a, an ability to share wisdom, even if it comes from our competitors, right? And to, to be able to build something that is of mutual benefit and value for all. Um, and this, organi this open organization community focuses on principles of transparency, collaboration, community, inclusivity, adaptability, all of the, the people processes that we need in order to achieve open innovation, right? It's not just about uh, tools, it's about the individuals who are using those tools and how they're working together to achieve new ways to create value. Uh, last but not least, if you're looking for a quick write-up on the business value of open source software for financial services firms, uh, look no further than our fine friends at Finos who have authored a white paper on that very same topic. 
Um, this white paper, it uh, runs the gamut of discussing uh, topics that are relevant to financial services firms, everything from how to perform effective risk mitigation when uh, using open source software solutions, risk mitigation when contributing to open source software projects, using your uh, energies in the open source world as a recruiting and retention tool. So it's uh, very useful. It's a quick read and uh, it's uh, basically brought to you again by practitioners within the, the, the Finos member community. Um, full disclosure, yours truly is one of the authors. So of course I'm going to say that this white paper is great. Um, and then uh, last but not least, um, I thought really long and hard about including these uh, these resources because they are very much directly from Red Hat. Um, and I cannot stand the number of conference presentations that I've gone to where I have gotten sales pitches because it really annoys me. Um, but I did decide to leave them in because these are all um, resources that either I have um, directly participated in or have had the opportunity to to benefit from, so I'm gonna share my own experience and hopefully you will also find significant value in what I'm sharing with you. Um, as I said earlier in the presentation, I'm a member of Red Hat's Open Source Program Office and we create um, a huge library of resources on um, creating and executing a successful open source strategy. Uh, we have documents that are available um, on our website, including like a, you know, how to start get started with a new open source project checklist. Um, and our team has also created a number of presentations to help uh, folks understand how to architect and approach having an open source strategy, including things like, um, you know, how to participate in an open source community and a beginner's guide to open source. Um, so if you're interested in those kinds of learning sessions, um, if you are a Red Hat customer, you can reach out to your account manager. If you are not a Red Hat customer, but you're still interested in learning more, please email me, please email Joe. Um, we're always happy to make sure that the right person is able to show up to share this knowledge with your organization um, because we very much believe in the value of open source. And so we're very happy to educate you whether you're, whether you're our customer or not. Um, another offering that Red Hat provides is through our uh, Open Innovation Labs group, and this is Open Leadership Coaching. Um, this is uh, this is an opportunity to, to talk to one of my dear colleagues, Shibnor Shah, who is an expert in industrial organizational psychology. And her mission is to help business executives have like the really hard conversations about how they are working together amongst themselves to create the culture that allows their business to innovate and how to achieve digital transformation from like the, the perspective of how their, their people work together, right? This is an entirely people-centric point of view on how to do technological innovation. Um, so uh, if you have the opportunity to talk to Shibnor, please do. I have regular one-on-ones with her and I benefit from the wisdom that she shares with me every day. Um, and then last not least, this um, this ebook that, uh, that I have read personally and have read multiple times, This Transformation Takes Practice. And this is a, a guide to understanding the Open Practice Library. And the Open Practice Library is a Red Hat curated set of uh, DevOps and product, product development practices and principles for um, learning about the discovery and delivery of software. And this is brought to you by Red Hat's um, Open Innovation Labs team. Um, I've never actually worked with the Open Innovation Labs team on a project because I am not a software developer, but I did have the opportunity two years ago to attend a training course for folks who might want to participate uh, in a lab session. And I have I have used what I have learned in that one week workshop on a biweekly basis ever since then. Um, the Open Practice Library has any number of exercises that your teams can go through to understand how they wish to create shared value, a shared definition of success, um, how to create uh, you know, work sprints that are actually effective, how to uncover and discover um, what are the the actual requirements for the for what are being built not only for the the team getting together to build it but for for their stakeholders within the organization and of course for the end customer um so i would like to to recommend this and i will i will just conclude by saying that um i tell everybody that uh the red hat labs email list is my favorite one to subscribe to and the one that always leaves me smiling um so of course i'm going to say great things about labs so folks that's that's all we have for you today um, we hope that uh, what we have shared with you is, is beneficial to you and useful. Um, Joe and I will be in uh, the virtual booth uh, 
for a couple times over the next couple of days. And we also wanted to let you know that there are some folks um, from our labs team who are hanging out in our booth if you're interested in learning more about um, our labs offering and the, the really the open practice library, which is um, a freely available resource online and how you might be able to use that uh, to consider your open source software journey and your work in open innovation. Thanks so much. Thank you very much.